Ready to go? Okay. Thank you, everybody. My name is Nick Tosanovich, Solutions Architect at Netronome. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, Smartnix. So, uh, Smartnix, uh, there's been quite a bit of buzz uh, in the industry uh, about Smartnix. Uh, at Netronome, we also call them intelligent server adapters, but uh, uh, people like to call them Smartnix, I guess, because it's shorter and it sounds cool. Uh, and I have nothing against that. Uh, before we talk specifically about uh, what a SmartNIC is, uh, I want to introduce uh, sort of where the SmartNIC plays in a CloudStack net network. Um, so uh, really we're going to focus in on uh, the compute node, uh, which is uh, the server uh, in the cloud uh, infrastructure, uh, which is uh, working within the context of an OpenStack cloud. And in the compute node, obviously, you have a CPU that's running your virtual machines. Uh, and then typically, there's a network interface card that's plugged in via a PCI slot uh, that performs uh, functions such as uh, talking to your uh, network switch, your top of rack switch through Ethernet uh, ports, uh, and then uh, doing some basic functions to the, uh, to the packets, uh, processing uh, you know, the, uh, the packets and uh, sending them uh, over the PCI bus, doing some DMA operations. Uh, in some cases, the basic uh, uh, NIC functions include things uh, like basic offloads, RSS is an example, or LSO, uh, check some offloads, things like that. And then there's specialized uh, offloads that some NICs do for things like storage and so on. Um, and then once the packet is delivered to the server, uh, that's where the server networking uh, data path uh, takes over. And uh, this is where richer features uh, are implemented. Uh, and these richer features are critical uh, to uh, successful deployments of uh, OpenStack clouds. Uh, so as an example, uh, you know, in OpenStack clouds, uh, typically there is uh, overlay uh, network support uh, to support things like uh, network virtualization and multi-tenancy. Uh, and in that case, uh, overlay tunnels such as VXLAN or other types of tunnel protocols need to be processed. Uh, and they're processed in the server networking data path. Uh, other things that can be done are more complex uh, traffic classification uh, for uh, policy-based forwarding and also security policy, both stateless and stateful, can be uh, implemented in the server-based networking data path. Uh, and then finally, uh, things such as uh, you know, customer-based or uh, workload-based uh, QoS, uh, metering, statistics, uh, and stateful op operations as well. Uh, so this rich set of uh, server-based networking data path functionality, uh, as I said, is critical to uh, cloud, uh, uh, OpenStack clouds, and today is commonly implemented in the server, uh, in software, uh, either running in uh, kernel uh, space or in user space in some implementations. So the key attributes of the server-based networking data path uh, in an OpenStack environment are uh, the ability to handle these rich features that we just discussed uh, and future features that may come along. Um, and then it's very important that the server-based networking data path is uh, very flexible and easy to use um, so that uh, operators can roll out features very quickly, uh, implement uh, things like new tunnel types, uh, and new features uh, in their uh, OpenStack clouds. So that implies uh, very uh, simple and easy programming and configuration uh, of the server-based networking data path. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, leverage of the open source e ecosystem is critical uh, here as well. Uh, what the uh, server-based networking data path must not be is a bottleneck to performance or uh, provide an excessive tax uh, on the server CPU. Unfortunately, that's exactly what's occurring today. Uh, and this graph illustrates uh, the performance of a typical uh, server-based networking data path based on Open vSwitch or OP OVS, and the performance that we get with that data path running it in software on an x86 CPU. Uh, and you see both a kernel-based and a user-based implementation for layer two or tunnel-based uh, processing uh, in the context of OVS. And uh, normalized per core, you know, it's roughly hits about a million packets per second of, uh, of processing. Um, so you can see that that's uh, not even close to 10 gig E line rate. Uh, many cores would be needed to support a 10 gig E line rate um, at that uh, performance level. 
Uh, and furthermore, operators are moving to 25 giggy, 40 giggy, and beyond in their networks. So this is a real problem today, and it's getting worse uh, as time goes on. Just to illustrate this in a little bit more detail, uh, let's say we take a typical implementation of a server-based networking data path and software running on four uh, CPU cores. Um, you know, uh, as we just said, you get about 4 million packets per second of uh, data path performance. And in a 24-core, typical 24-core modern uh, C server uh, CPU, you have 20 cores available for VMs. And uh, if at a VM workload of 1 million packets per second, which is not unusual, those VMs would be asking for 20 million packets per second. Yet the data path can only deliver 4 million packets per second. So you have a bottleneck, and basically your applications are running in a starving state uh, and are not able to perform. Now, you can try to solve this problem by adding more cores, throwing more cores at the problem, and, uh, and uh, you know, in this case, you, s you can have 12 cores uh, delivering 12 million packets per second to 12 VMs, and there's a nice balance in terms of uh, data path performance, but look what happened. You just took up half of your server CPU, and it's not running applications. So that's not a good utilization of uh, your cloud infrastructure resources. This is why uh, we uh, need smart NICs. Uh, I think uh, there's a wide recognition here that this is a problem that needs to be solved. And the way to solve it is to uh, take the server networking data path and accelerate and offload that uh, networking data path uh, down into the smart NIC. In this case, we're showing the data path being implemented in a processor on the NIC card. Uh, and uh, all of those functions, the same functionality you had before, uh, can be implemented in the processor on the, uh, on the NIC card. And the processor here is uh, optimized for server-based networking processing so that uh, it can implement those functions at a much lower cost and power per bit than they can be implemented on the server. And at the same time, you get all of your uh, CPU, expensive server CPU resources back for applications. So with the smart NIC, you now have an even balance, okay? The data path can support the same data rate that all of those VMs uh, need, uh, even uh, to 23 million packets per second and beyond. And uh, you have minimal impact on your CPU resources and almost all of your CPU is now available to run your applications. Now there are different models. Not all smart NICs are created equal. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, how the smart NIC uh, operates and uh, different options uh, for uh, offload. So uh, on the left of the screen, uh, you see a partial offload model. Uh, in that case, uh, you split up the functionality and you perform uh, some of the functions, uh, offload some of the functions onto the smart NIC, and some of the functions uh, still occur on the server. Uh, this might be because the smart NIC may not uh, you know, be uh, able to process all of the functions uh, or, or something like that, or they're not implemented yet. Uh, so that's one model. It's called partial uh, function offload. Uh, the next model is uh, partial flow of offload. And this is the case where the smart NIC can process all of the traffic, all the functions are, are, are on the smart NIC, but it may have a limited capacity for flows. So uh, you may cache a subset of your flows uh, in the smart NIC, uh, and uh, accelerate those, uh, but if you uh, go beyond that capacity, then you'll have to fall back to the server-based networking data path. So you get some acceleration, but it depends on how many flows are active at a given time. And then, of course, you can have a combination of those two, partial function uh, offload and partial flow offload. Um, so these are partial offload models. And, uh, and then, of course, there can be a full offload model, and in the full offload model, all of the functionality uh, is implemented on the smart NIC. Uh, and all of the flows uh, that are active can be held on the smart NIC so that there is no uh, intermediate step. All of the traffic gets accelerated and offloaded and delivered directly to the applications. Um, now, the next one on the right side of the screen shows a full data plane offload model uh, but in addition to that, uh, you have a control plane offload as well. Uh, so in the previous models, uh, the control agent was always running on the server. Uh, in this case, uh, the control agent can be uh, run on the NIC card on some type of a processor uh, that, it, that would uh, be present there. 
Uh, this use case is, uh, is uh, applicable in environments, cloud environments, where um, you know, the host operating system is unknown or uh, not trusted in some way. Uh, and is also very useful in bare metal environments. So uh, you don't have to be running VMs at all. You could have a bare metal server, uh, and you may want to have SmartNIC functionality to implement things like security policies and things like that on the NIC card. Uh, in that case, uh, typically, the control agent is accessed via the network and not via the server, uh, so that uh, uh, basically the server uh, doesn't have to know that uh, anything is running, but it's getting uh, you know, the ability to uh, get security firewall policies, for instance, uh, metering, uh, QoS, and things like that. So, you know, I, I presented several models for uh, SmartNIC offload. Um, and uh, the key point here is that, you know, it's not all black and white. Uh, there is a spectrum, right? Um, there are uh, approaches that, uh, you know, do, uh, you know, uh, less flows and approaches that do more flows, approaches that do less functions, approaches that do more functions. So there's a spectrum here. Uh, and really, uh, if you're looking for a smart NIC, you want to look for one that tries to optimize uh, that uh, for your data center. So uh, the more functions you offload that are applicable for your uh, use case, and the more flows you offload uh, in your flow environment, the higher the performance is going to be, the more CPU cores you're going to save. And that translates directly into total cost of ownership uh, in terms of CapEx for servers and things like that, and power and uh, overall operational cost. Now, uh, we talked a lot about uh, performance. We talked a lot about CPU utilization. Uh, we talked a little bit about flexibility in terms of uh, being able to program or change the functionality and adapt the functionality of the SmartNIC. Uh, but uh, flexibility is more than just programmability. Sometimes uh, people just uh, think of those as being the same thing, but in a, a modern uh, OpenStack cloud, uh, flexibility means more than just being able to change the functionality of the data path. Uh, there's a lot of uh, operational complexity in implementing uh, a large-scale data center. And uh, flexibility uh, is, uh, is, is important when you think about dynamically moving workloads around, uh, not having to worry about uh, the software infrastructure in terms of drivers and things like that for your workloads. Uh, so it's very important. And, uh, and so uh, not having limitations on where you can place specific workloads, uh, not having limitations on vendor-specific drivers is, uh, directly uh, translates into operational efficiency for uh, cloud service providers. Uh, so, you know, in addition to being programmable, the key point here is that a smart NIC uh, should have a strategy, must have a strategy, to be as um, vendor agnostic as possible in terms of its uh, driver architecture, and then also to um, um, effectively uh, be truly flexible. Um, it should have uh, something that's typically built on a VertIO or power virtualized driver infrastructure. So here's an area where uh, Netronome uh, has announced a uh, architecture called uh, XVIO, uh, and uh, X XVIO stands for Express Bird IO. And uh, what this does is it, uh, it kind of puts together the best of, of all worlds. Uh, it takes driver architectures that are very uh, efficient and high performance, that are based on things like DPDK Polmo drivers uh, and SRIOV principles, and it integrates them together and presents them to workloads in the same common way, uh, in a vendor agnostic way, through VertIO. And that's what XVIO essentially is. Uh, and what XVIO uh, basically uh, translates to, uh, to the uh, end user, uh, is very high performance. Um, basically, uh, the performance of XVIO is um, you know, on par with SRIOV implementations. But at the same time, you get rich services uh, and you get high flexibility, as we just said, because you, don't ha you can move workloads around and you don't have to pin workloads to specific resources. Uh, so that's uh, some of the key principles behind uh, XVIO. So what does a smart uh, SmartNIC uh, look like? Uh, here's a, uh, a picture of one. Uh, Netronome provides uh, a line of SmartNICs uh, called Agilio, Agilio CX. 
and as I said earlier in the presentation, we also call them Intelligent Server Adapters, or ISAs. Uh, we have uh, versions that are based on uh, 10 giggy and 40 giggy standards, and uh, 25 giggy uh, is coming as well. Uh, and the key point here is that uh, we support all of those different offload models that I presented uh, previously, uh, partial and full offload. Um, full offload because we can support uh, millions of simultaneous flows. So uh, in any real world environments, we can effectively have all the flows uh, being offloaded down on the SmartNIC card itself. Uh, and uh, our metrics uh, are uh, showing a 20x performance gain uh, core per core on the x86 over user space based OVS implementations. So very high efficiency. And uh, as I noted, we have the XVIO strategy to provide the uh, workload flexibility. So um, here's a picture of one. You can also uh, pick one up and touch one in our booth, which is located uh, right over there uh, behind the stage uh, to the left, uh, to my right. Uh, and, uh, and we'd be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Uh, right now, or do you want to? Questions? Yes. Just wanted to ask, uh, so, like, does it support like firewall features, connection tracking? Kind of yeah, excellent question. Um, question was, does it support uh, firewall features or connection tracking? Uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, we have support uh, for uh, uh, in our OVS offering. Uh, we support the uh, contract functionality, which is integrated into OVS 2.5. Uh, so that's basically a stateful uh, connection tracking feature. Uh, and you can implement the things like distributed uh, stateful firewalls for micro-segmentation and things like that. And that is supported in our hardware and our software. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, our vRouter package as well, yes. OK. Other questions? OK, well, thank you very much for your attendance.